Well, we'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of Intercept U, our continuing discussion about uh, structural insulated panels and the, the building industry overall. And again, we always remind you to <clears throat> subscribe, like, uh, make comments on our videos. That helps us to get our message out to more individuals and helps us to know uh, what's important to you and what we can be talking about. Today, we've got Joe Pasma, our, our national sales manager with us today. And again, I'm John Goals, the regional sales manager um, in, the, in the Midwest. We're here to talk today specifically about something that uh, maybe isn't on your radar at all, but maybe it is. It's that idea of the building code specific to um, continuous insulation. Um, the newer codes are using this term, continuous insulation. So what we want to do is talk to Joe about what that is, why it's important, and how we can achieve uh, what, what is necessary in order to satisfy the code. So maybe we can start, Joe, by talking about that idea of why is it important as far as uh, continuous insulation. Is, is, first of all, I guess, is continuous insulation necessary in order to mat, meet the code? Hmm. Well, John, as we've talked before about many different subjects, um, the answer is really, it depends. And why I say that is the 2021 IECC has two different paths that you can follow to obtain or meet um, the energy codes. So depending on which path you take, one has continuous insulation in it, the other uses terminology of, of the U-factor or UA methodology, where you're actually averaging um, the U-value of the materials in the assembly. And why this comes into play, what's so important about it, is that in order for a building to be energy efficient, we want to minimize the amount of thermal bridges that we have between the interior of the building and the exterior of the building. So when you, when you think about a stud framed wall, stick framed wall, numbers and, and, and terminology of framing factors are used of 20 to 25%. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you were to just average the surface of the wall, 20 to 25% of that wall is actually solid lumber that touches both the inside and the outside of the building. Well, if you think about a, a bridge that crosses a chasm, a, a big gorge, and you want to get from one side to the other, you can think about that wall cavity as this big chasm. And then you end up with these studs that cross the chasm, touching the inside and the outside. Well, if that's energy running through there, going across that bridge, we're losing it, either to the inside or the outside, depending on whether you're heating or cooling. So to minimize that thermal bridging, they've come up with this idea of continuous insulation where we actually cover up the studs on the outside of the building with insulation, rigid insulation, and that then prevents that thermal bridging to occur. Well, if you're, that's one methodology that you can use. So by definition, continuous insulation means that there aren't any studs touching the interior and exterior of the wall or material that does that. It's separated by the insulation. Just just to step in for a moment, just to <clears throat> excuse me, give folks an idea of of how much of a bridge that is, how much energy is really traveling inside from inside to out. Uh, when I was a drywall contractor for many years, I learned very quickly that when you spray texture or paint on a cold day, ten degrees or so, as the texture or paint dried, you could see it would dry slower. You could see every stud in the wall because it dried slower because it was that much cooler over every stud. And I even learned that I never sprayed texture when it was colder than 10 degrees outside because sometimes it would actually freeze to the wall. Uh, the, 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 the wet texture would hit the wall and freeze in those spots where there were thermal, thermal bridges. And then when it melted, it would run down the wall. And so that idea of is a thermal bridge a big deal? I mean, we've got insulation in the stud cavity and then we've got a solid two by six is it really a big, it really is. It, it's, it's very evident. And we have graphics that I'm sure that our, our tech guy is showing some of these graphics, showing not only the definition of, of continuous insulation, but also showing what it looks like as that, as that heat loss radiates uh, through that wall and really dramatically reduces the efficiency of the wall. 
Exactly. So another option that the 2021 IECC gives us is what they call the performance-based methodology. So if you take that framing factor or 20 to 25% of the studs that are touching the inside and the outside and reduce that down to something, say three to 5% like a SIP wall, that in effect, you've reduced that amount of thermal bridging and you're essentially doing the same thing as having continuous insulation on the outside over all of those studs. So it's two different methodologies that get you the same result. It's sort of like, you know, a lot of people watch football and, and understand the game um, and how you score points. Well, a touchdown, as long as you cross the goal line, you can cross the goal line by throwing the ball across or running it across the goal line. You score six points either way. You have an option as to which way to satisfy the six points. That's sort of like the performance-based methodology in the building code, where you select your materials and the U factor times the area, the average, if you will, the weighted average of the insulation in that wall, you're able to achieve, in this case, six points, or you, you get the, you, you meet what the the energy code is requiring. If you think of kicking a field goal in football, you only score three points by kicking a field goal. That's the only way that you can do it. That's the equivalent to the prescriptive methodology in the IECC. If you use a stick frame wall and you have R20 in the cavity, you're mandated to put R5 or 10 or 15 or whatever it is on the outside and continuous insulation. Those are, that's the only option that you have. So back to your original question, John, is continuous insulation required by the code? Now I can say, yes, it's required if you follow the prescriptive path. No, if you follow the performance path. So you have two options. And the cool thing that structural insulated panels give us is an option. It takes away a whole lot of layers, a whole lot of effort that builders have to put in to meet those energy requirements. So it's really a cool option. So let me ask you this question. Why is now the best time for homeowners to build with structural insulated panels, also known as SIPs? You've been dreaming of your new home for years. You've been planning, saving, researching, and you've decided you're going to pull the trigger on building your new home now. Comfort? Safety, sustainability, a healthy living environment, efficiency, and peace of mind are all of value to you, and you want your new home to reflect these values. Building with Intercept SIPs aligns with your values. The building codes have been changing over the past few years. Building a new home to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code complies with the Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home Program. What is the Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home? The Department of Energy's Zero Ready Home is a high performance home that is so energy efficient that a renewable energy system could offset most or all of the home's annual energy use. So how much is peace of mind worth to you? If your goal is to provide a comfortable, sustainable home for you and your family, SIPS is the direction you want to go. Now is the perfect time to check out the many benefits of SIP construction. Click the link below to find out more about building with Intercept SIPs. Why are the codes increasing so much? What's, what's, what's the motivation behind the, perform, or the energy code becoming so much more stringent and so much uh, more, more difficult to reach, maybe, maybe is the right word? The world as a population seems to understand, or there's different schools of thought about global warming and temperature change. And whether you believe it or not, temperature change is occurring. Um, what the reason for that, that we're not gonna argue about that during this discussion, I guess. But that type, what we do know is that as we heat our homes and the energy that we lose or the energy that's used to heat and cool our homes, 
we can control that and we can reduce, we can do a better job of using that energy efficiently. So by the building codes increasing the R value from a prescriptive standpoint in walls and roofs or decreasing the U value, they're inverses of one another. So one goes up, the other goes down. So if you decrease the U value, what you're in essence doing is using less energy to heat and cool our buildings. That's the crux of the whole thing. And then once you have an envelope that is efficient on our buildings, the walls and the roof, just like the model behind you, now you have something that we can control from a mechanically uh, ventilated and heating and cooling systems that optimize all of that. So now the whole system works better together. And that's, I think, where everybody's going. So, so really the ultimate goal um, with this energy code is to reduce greenhouse gas, re reduce carbon footprint, make a, a more efficient system that is losing less to the atmosphere. Um, so with that said, you talked about a SIP house having, you know, maybe 3% thermal bridges. Um, does it make sense in that setting to go to zero, to, 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 to eliminate thermal bridges altogether? Is that, is, is, what's the return on investment when we start talking about? Exactly. It, and, and that's a great question. Um, it, it's like checking boxes when you're taking a test. You know, and, and do I just check all of the boxes so that I I satisfy those requirements? Or do we take into account money is always an issue? And and you you said return on investment, ROI, the cost diminishing returns. How much do I have to put in to maximize what I'm doing? And that's sort of what the SIP wall and roof system does. Yes. It it we minimize the amount of thermal bridging that occurs and we do it in such a way that we maximize the efficiency of the cost associated to get to that equivalent performance so uh, can you use rigid insulation and eliminate all thermal bridging yes but at what cost and then the question is does that cost outweigh what we could do if, if you used an alternative material like a structural insulated panel? So, so, so when we talk about return on investment, uh, it's easy to go down that road of dollars and cents. Um, no doubt, Greg, our man behind the camera here, uh, we can also show the chart showing about talking about return on investment when it comes to greenhouse gas and, and carbon footprint. Uh, again, there's an investment in building a house. We uh, it, it costs to build a house when it comes to the effect that it has on on the world around us. But what is that return on investment? And in my math, I keep going back and over and over and over again. And what it costs to build a SIP house, as far as the carbon footprint and greenhouse gas, uh, eliminating that last little bit of thermal bridging will never pay for itself. In, in its return on this, in the life of that building, uh, we'll never recapture the the greenhouse gas and carbon footprint that we would have to invest to eliminate that last little bit. And so that's the that's the bottom line. We want to do the best thing. We want to find that that balance. And you you talked about the point of diminishing returns at some point if it's going to outlast uh, if the re the return on investment is longer than the life of, of the building, uh, we've lost ground. So it's one of those things to factor in that it's not this all or nothing. It's not zero thermal bridges or or twenty five percent thermal bridges, but finding that 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 proper place to invest really makes sense. That optimum medium, and to to help with that, on our, our intercept website on our technical page, we have um, the SEPA best practice document BP one, and that talks in there about um, energy efficient shells and how, how the the exterior envelope can be a SIP can satisfy some of these requirements. And specifically, chapter 1.1 and the appendices go through and show with calculations how this UA factor or this UA methodology 
works because I'm sure our viewers are looking at this and saying, well, all, all right, all of this sounds good, but how do I put it into practice? And the long and the short of it is with the 2021 IECC, if you use a six inch SIP wall and a 12 inch SIP roof panel, these are nominals, you meet those energy codes and they can be used in any climate zone throughout the country. So it, it really simplifies it back down to, all right, as a builder, what do you got to do? Six inch wall, 12 inch roof, and you got that taken care of. And most of those codes are going to require some sort of blower door test where you're talking about the tightness of that envelope itself. SIPs will help you get there. Typically, you're looking at, at three air changes per hour or less in the northern climates, five in the south. SIPs, it's not uncommon to be under one and a half air changes per hour, right out of the chutes. So it, we've got some options that are really cost effective back to your return on investment kind of theory. So I think it's worth people asking questions and checking it out. We've really focused on one of the three factors that we talk about when it comes to energy efficiency, our value, thermal bridging, uh, air infiltration. We've really focused on that idea of thermal bridging today. We can have other discussions about the other two and, and where we come in on that as well. Uh, as always, the, the idea behind Intercept U and, and these videos is to either answer questions, uh, maybe questions you didn't know you had, or to raise questions uh, and to educate you as the viewer enough to know what questions you should be asking. And so again, we always encourage you to, to ask some questions in the comment or get a hold of your regional sales manager. Uh, go onto our website and, and ask questions because educating, uh, this is the fun part of this job, is, is educating folks so that they understand uh, the value of, of using intercept and SIPs as part of the, the structure. And we'll talk more in future videos about some of those other factors that go into it as well. So thank you for, for tuning in today and we look forward to our next discussion. Joe, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. You're welcome. And one one quick mention, don't forget to add comments or, or suggestions below um, and like us and let us know what we can do to answer your future questions. But thanks for having me, John. You bet. We look forward to our next discussion and intercept you.